Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the President's Council of Advisors on, in Science and Technology. I'm Maria Zuber, one of the co-chairs. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the meeting today the members of PCAST, our speakers, and members of the general public uh, who are tuning in. Uh, today, we hope to continue the momentum we started at the first part of the meeting yesterday, um, where we're addressing the president's charge to us in using science and technology to address uh, issues associated with climate change. And now I'm going to turn things over to my co-chair and the president's science advisor, Eric Lander. Thank you very much, Maria, and welcome, everybody, to day two of this PCAST meeting, where we have a great session ahead. I want to note this meeting is on the record being recorded and will be posted on the OSTP PCAST website so that people will be able to watch it in perpetuity. Um, but I want to welcome all the people who are here live watching it in person. And I am really excited about this session. We've been planning it for a while. I want to thank all the speakers. And I'm going to turn over to our third co-chair, Francis Arnold, who will be chairing today's session. Thank you, Eric. I'm moderating. Uh, this session on accelerating innovation in energy technologies, because the president's letter to Eric Lander asked, how can breakthroughs in science and technology create powerful new solutions to address climate change, propelling market-driven change, jumpstarting economic growth, improving health, and growing jobs, especially in communities that have been left behind? We will now hear from six people who can speak to this question, and I expect a lively discussion after their presentations. I'll remind you that speaker bios are posted on the PCAST website. Now, our first five invited speakers uh, are uh, start with Harry Atwater, who is the Chair of Engineering and Applied Science and the Howard Hughes Professor of Applied Physics and Material Science at the California Institute of Technology. Among other things, he researches high efficiency photovoltaics and photoelectrochemical processes for generation of solar fuels. His work has resulted in world records for solar photovoltaic conversion and photoelectrochemical water splitting. He will be followed by Andrew Holland, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Fusion Industry Association, which he started in 2018 to bring leading private fusion developers together to support new public-private partnerships in order to advance commercial fusion energy. He led the American Security Project's energy and climate work, and he worked in the U.S. Senate as energy environmental policy legislative assistant to Ch Senator Chuck Hagel. We'll then hear from Katie Ray, the founding CEO and managing partner of The Engine. This is a venture capital fund built by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The Engine invests in early stage companies solving the world's biggest problems. She has raised two funds with $500 million of assets under management. In 2018, she founded Equity Summit, an annual event bringing together female and underrepresented minority fund managers and world leading partners. Then we'll hear from Arman Cohen, co-founder and executive director of the Clean Air Task Force, which he has led since its formation in 1996. Previously, he founded and led the Conservation Law Foundation's Energy Project focusing on energy efficiency, utility resource planning, and electric industry structure. Then we'll hear from Jigar Shah, who is director of the Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy. He was most recently co-founder and president at Generate Capital, helping entrepreneurs accelerate decarbonization solutions through low-cost infrastructure as a service financing. Prior to that, he founded Sun Edison, a company that pioneered pay as you save solar financing and then served as founding CEO of the Carbon War Room, a global nonprofit founded to help entrepreneurs address climate change. We're also pleased that White House Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy will give some remarks. Ms. McCarthy leads the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, 
mobilizing a whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis, creating good paying union jobs and securing environmental justice. Previously, she served as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and then as president and CEO of the National Resources Defense Council. So with that, we can start with Harry Atwater. Okay, uh, let's see, Francis, I need to be able to share the screen, I think. Okay, there we go. Um, and let's see. Okay, can you see the slides now? You need to, uh, you've got the two slides side by side. Okay, yeah, there you go. Like that? Okay, that works. Good. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, talk today about accelerating innovation in solar technologies, which is an area of my expertise. And I'll just begin reflecting on the fact that uh, since the early 1980s, uh, when I was a graduate student at MIT, we've seen a million fold growth in the cumulative installed PV generating capacity uh, in uh, peak electric uh, uh, watts. And that number is approaching and will is expected to pass this uh, year, sometime late this year, one terawatt electric. And to sort of put that in context, uh, the world's electricity needs uh, or world's electricity capacity is currently about 2.6 terawatts electric. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so the one terawatt peak uh, corresponds to about 200 gigawatts uh, uh, electric, if we consider uh, continuously dispatchable electricity. So uh, in terms of overall world supply, it's supplying uh, around 10% of the world's uh, electric needs. Uh, but what's really amazing to see is if you look at the numbers for 2020 on the right, it is the dominant fraction of the in newly installed electricity capacity. And in the United States, by the way, uh, uh, solar PV is currently generating about 3% of US electricity, but similar to the world um, added generating capacity, solar last year was the leading uh, form of uh, new generating capacity that uh, has been added uh, in the United States. So, uh, and so to think about this, we can think about the fact that uh, solar technology, uh, unlike, uh, uh, for example, fossil energy technologies, is a technology that under, uh, undergoes progress with uh, uh, along an experience curve. And so, similar to the, you know, historic and legend, you know, uh, well-known uh, decrease in the cost per watt of computing that we know from Moore's law, photovoltaics over this time period has undergone a similar. Uh, dramatic change, uh, not uh, six orders of magnitude in drop of the cost per watt as in the case of computing, but more than two orders of magnitude, almost three orders of magnitude uh, by early next year over this same time period. And so that resulted in the uh, uh, levelized cost of electricity for solar becoming very competitive with other forms of uh, energy in the last few years. Uh, and it's also quite interesting to just uh, contemplate that the cost of a solar module on a per area basis now uh, in its manufactured form is uh, typically less than that of an installed window. So it's uh, really reached a, uh, quite a level of capacity uh, and uh, uh, cost reduction. Uh, so the sort of status and the overview is that solar is here today. It's at scale and it's growing. It's growing substantially. Uh, of course, there have been hiccups in supply chain and price fluctuations during the pandemic. Uh, but if we look towards 2050, the consensus among modelers who are looking at uh, world energy outlook is that PV uh, uh, very well uh, may be the world's majority energy source in terms of supply if we prioritize decarbonization. And as a result, solar has undergone in the last decade a transition from being a niche energy supplier to becoming a major energy source. And as a result, the operators really have to prioritize resilience and reliability. It's no longer something that's a sort of marginal form of energy whose uh, reliability 
uh, you know, uh, is, uh, ca cannot be uh, uh, counted upon. Uh, so it, it needs to be extremely reliable. And as a result, uh, governments have, you know, will, are and be, will uh, continue to take strong interest in solar PV, both on the manufacturing and the supply side. And so the question of cost will become a very multifaceted one. At the moment, uh, the solar PV uh, install capacity is dominated by crystal and multi-crystalline silicon technologies. These are technologies that were invented in the United States uh, and early uh, uh, development here, but the manufacturing is uh, primarily offshore, uh, predominated by manufacturing in China. Uh, for cadmium telluride PV, a thin film photovoltaics technology, the United States dominates that both in the R&D and the manufacturing. And these two together, uh, silicon PV makes up about 90% of the install and cadmium telluride a little less than 10%, uh, can meet the US solar PV needs to about 2035. There is emerging from R&D an uh, exciting new technology called perovskite uh, PV. Uh, this is a new technology that uh, has a very low, potentially low cost manufacturing, but it's too early to tell whether the reliability and the performance characteristics can be brought together in this value triad that's been really important in driving solar innovation. Uh, so uh, as we look to the future and think about places for potential investments, uh, a very important one is in uh, investments in the R&D and the development activities that allow us to ensure the resilience and the reliability of solar as it goes forward. And so to just sort of illustrate this, this is a, a set of data uh, from Teresa Barnes at NREL uh, with a uh, looking at, if we take a, a typical warranted module lifetime of 30 years, and we would degrade that module lifetime uh, by say 15 years, that corresponds to a loss in generating capacity of uh, hundreds of gigawatts uh, on today's installed base. Similarly, if we could uh, extend the warranty period or the lifetime of a module uh, by al and almost double its lifetime, that would correspond to a substantial increase. So reliability, in addition to performance is an, uh, and uh, performance degradation, is extremely important for a given installed amount of PV generating capacity in determining how much energy is actually generated. So this is an area uh, that uh, deserves a significant emphasis. If we think about the capacity for PV to contribute to energy, uh, and we look at uh, total final energy consumption uh, and the uh, sort of historical growth of world electricity, and then we think about uh, scenarios that would involve substantial increases in electricity use due to decarbonization strategies that prioritize electrification. It's interesting to ask the question, could solar PV actually meet this challenge of an area of increased uh, electrification in our economy. Uh, and so these three curves uh, project different uh, um, solar capacity growth rates. And broadly, the analysis from this uh, group, a terawatt working group, concluded that solar can make very substantial contributions, uh, predominant contributions to a scenario that would prioritize increased electrification. So <clears throat> in the United States, in terms of uh, PV, uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. leads in the thin film cadmium telluride technology, uh, first solar, uh, an American born and made company, uh, uh, is uh, uh, the dominant uh, producer in this marketplace. And if we think about accelerating innovation, uh, one of the, what are some of the options? Uh, one would be to uh, prioritize the, this newly emerging perovskite PV uh, technology, which has high efficiency and potentially low cost of manufacturing. It leverages capabilities in the United States with regard to uh, uh, making the manufacturing process uh, be uh, uh, scalable and uh, low cost. Uh, and it offers an opportunity to uh, capitalize uh, a U.S. manufacturing base and supply chain ecosystem in this new technology if it emerges. So one area we were asked by PCAST to think about where would be areas where the government investment could, uh, could accelerate innovation. And so one area would be to establish what I would call a perovskite foundry, a US perovskite thin film PV foundry to evaluate this triad of performance, uh, reliability and, uh, and uh, cost of manufacturing uh, and to determine whether 
this new emergent material can meet these challenges and establish a new US solar PV manufacturing industry. So in my final uh, minutes, I wanna to look over the horizon at some of the other options where solar energy is being used to directly create not only electricity, but chemical products such as hydrogen and fuels. And this sort of illustrates many pathways. So the pathway we've been talking about here is solar to generate electricity. Uh, solar can also be used directly to generate hydrogen using a device whose uh, internal engine resembles that of a photovoltaic device, but which uses catalysis to directly produce fuels. We call that process artificial photosynthesis. So that offers an opportunity to directly generate fuels rather than the indirect route of using electricity and then electrolysis, which is now beginning to enter the marketplace as a way to scale the capacity for hydrogen generation. Similarly, artificial photosynthesis can be used directly to produce not only hydrogen, but hydrocarbon liquid fuels so that we could generate uh, decarbonized uh, sectors in transportation, such as uh, for sustainable aviation fuel that are otherwise difficult to decarbonize. And I'll just end with one research highlight that shows that in the last few years, accelerating innovation has led this new emerging technology, which is in the R&D stage and uh, investments on the Department of Energy have uh, uh, substantially accelerated this, to lead to solar to hydrogen efficiencies that are similar to the solar to electric efficiencies that we expect from PV panels today. So if we can extend the reliability, as I mentioned earlier, that's a key aspect for uh, uh, innovation and, and, and scaling innovation, then this uh, could be a disruptive technology for directly generating low cost hydrogen uh, in parallel with the indirect routes. So that's basically my uh, briefing for today. Thank you very much, Harry Atwater. We'll now move to fusion uh, with Andrew Holland. Dr. Arnold, thank you. Let me get my uh, slide set up here. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really excited to be with you all today. This is uh, a great opportunity. Uh, my name is Andrew Holland, CEO of the Fusion Industry Association. I'm not here as a scientist, I'm here as a policy expert and as the CEO of the Industry Association working to commercialize fusion energy at speed. Uh, so what that means is if you have any scientific questions about anything I say here, I'm happy to set up briefings directly with the leaders of our member companies. I'll answer as best I can. But let's start with the basics. Why fusion innovation? Don't we have the tools for decarbonizing energy now? We just heard a great slide deck uh, about solar innovation. Why do we need more clean energy options? Well, fusion is uniquely suited for the rapid scale up that will be necessary to address climate change and bring affordable energy to the world. Fusion energy is reliable, firm power that will replace fossil energy sources such as coal and natural gas while acting as an excellent complement to renewables the wind and solar that, that we know will dominate the grid of the future. Fusion is generating green jobs in science and manufacturing today, and these will only expand exponentially as the industry grows. Fusion can support growing economies and raise living standards around the world without environmental sacrifices. Finally, fusion will break the geopolitics of energy. So a country's destiny is not determined by the size of its hydrocarbon deposits or its mined earth, rare earth minerals. So let me un underline this. Fusion will light the darkness, provide the jobs and industrial base of the 21st century, and make for a more peaceful world. And fusion's closer than you think. Scientists have been working on fusion for more than half a century, enabled by DOE funding. You can see the real advances uh, in this graph here put together by Sam Wurzel and Scott Shu from RPE. You see steady advances over time towards break-even fusion energy across technology approaches. But cost and complexity uh, acted as a barrier to net energy. Now, let's add the wider technology revolutions our society is seeing. Advances in materials, computing power, and advanced manufacturing technologies have resulted in new ideas of how to achieve commercial fusion energy. That puts us today on the cusp of a key milestone, net gain energy. More energy out than in, sometimes expressed as Q greater than one. I believe we'll see that milestone hit soon, 
whether it's the National Igni Ignition Facility out at, at Lawrence Livermore in California, or it's a private approach. We're in the years, not decades, time frame for net gain energy. And the combination of technology revolutions and scientific understanding will enable us to put that milestone into a commercial package. That, that's why you've seen this explosive growth in private fusion industry over the last few years. Those skeptics who joke 30 years away and always will be simply haven't tuned in. They haven't seen the advances in the last few years. As I'll show, FIA members believe we can get to fusion on the grid in a decade. It's time to capitalize on our longstanding investment in fusion science. U.S. government investment has gotten us this close, but now we have to transition fusion from science to industry. The government must continue to invest in fusion, but the focus must be on the commercialization of fusion energy, not on basic science alone. And let me be clear, if the U.S. does not act to accelerate fusion energy, the world won't wait. What's at stake is American leadership and competitiveness in the next great new industry of the 21st century. The UK right now is the leader, uh, world leader in planning for fusion with both a plan for a government operated pilot plant called STEP by 2040, robust outreach to private partners and a draft approach to the regulation of fusion energy under the lead of their environmental and occupational safety regulators, not their nuclear regulator. Our global stra strategic competitor is moving too. China is beginning to rapidly scale up their fusion work after announcements of records in plasma confinement at their tokamak in Hefe. They're building a new uh, campus for R&D of fusion power, power plant components. And last summer, they approved building of a new burning plasma experiment they're calling BEST by 2027, moving towards their demo pilot plant in the 2030s. Other moves include the new Japanese prime minister announcing that they will determine their government's plan for commercial, commercialization of fusion this year. And likewise, the EU, the largest funder of ITER, is beginning a planning process to determine how to accelerate European fusion. Meanwhile, sovereign wealth funds from key markets are making their bets on private fusion. Now, let me talk some details about how fusion is moving from a science experiment into the marketplace. As of January 1st, I can verify 31 private fusion companies around the world. 27 of them are members of the FIA and, and 21 of, of that 31 are American companies. So this is at this point, an American industry. In our survey from mid 2021, we found $1.87 billion in investment. And that has grown uh, rapidly to over $4.3 billion by December, 2021. And I expect further growth this year at similar scale or even higher. Few more key points that I'll expand on in coming slides. Companies are focused on electricity generation and they largely expect commercialization by the 2030s. Now, let me go into those a little further. While fusion energy will ultimately enable a revolution in all energy uses, the primary market that private fusion is aiming for is electricity generation. Notable other areas of interest include clean hydrogen and ammonia production and even zero carbon shipping. So fusion will enable the deep decarbonization across the economy that we need. And I wanna note a surprise when we did this survey. The private sector approach has enabled a broad diversification of technological risks by having companies take multiple different approaches to fusion. Unlike the government funded approach, which has repeatedly cut technologies and moved forward towards one, towards one way. Without any planning, there are no FIA members who are pursuing the exact same approach. They're competing along multiple parallel pathways, magnetic, inertial, magneto-inertial, electrostatic, and more. That's what happens when investors accept techno technological risk in the search for innovation and speed. And let me just give acknowledgement to the broad membership of the FIA shown here. We exist to support our membership in accelerating com towards commercial fusion energy. In practice, what that means is government advocacy, regulatory support, building business connections through an affiliate membership of 40, 40 companies and nonprofits, and building public awareness. In short, my job is to ensure that the, the road to commercialization is smooth so that when we do achieve break even, our member companies can expand rapidly without artificial constraints. Now, I want to touch on this slide because it's really important. I'm going to uh, sit here for a second. This is a timeline that is relevant. Let me highlight the most important takeaway from our survey. 
This accelerated timeline is demanded by investment schedules, but also is demanded by the increasingly urgent needs of the climate crisis. Timelines here are indicative and common across the industry, but of course there is some variation. Right now, thanks to decades of scientific research in fusion, the design and construction of break-even uh, breakthrough experiments is ongoing by private fusion companies. And this will result by the mid 2020s in fusion devices that will achieve a scientific proof of concept, scientific break even or the equivalent proof needed to move forward. <laughs> that is soon, the mid 2020s, we're talking three, four, five years from now. Once successful, companies will then move into building and operating pilot plants scaling up support systems in the balance of plant, and ultimately a rapid global deployment of fusion energy by the middle of next decade. So let me acknowledge the skeptics here. This is fast, a decade or more faster than any competitor government programs. And to those who always accuse us of over-promising, over let, let me make clear that fusion innovation is a function of both time and money. Fusion is hard. Fusion will always be 30 years away if no one invests in it. And that's why the catalyzing effect of private investment has been so critical. Now with that introduction, I wanna run through a few high level policy recommendations. And we, I've got specifics on all these and funding asks to Congress and such like that. But today I'm gonna to give you the top line changes needed for a serious acceleration in fusion innovation. <clears throat> As a representative of the, of the private fusion industry, here are three goals that the US government can do to meaningfully accelerate fusion energy. First, the Department of Energy must become a partner in the pathway to fusion energy commercialization. Our fusion program for decades has lacked an energy mission. Our companies wanna work closely with DOE labs and scientists. Second, if you wanna move fast, then the federal government should directly support those who are demonstrating the ability to move fast. We have a plan for a new public-private partnership program that would enable the best of both the public and private sector approaches to fusion. And please note uh, something here, it, it, something that I've noticed in, in these discussions. Pilot plants are built by private industry for private industry. That's the purpose of the pilot plant. Finally, we need to be certain that regulations won't needlessly slow the rollout of fusion. So, to start, this may seem obvious, but anyone who's interacted with the Office of Silent Science understands the challenge. The fusion program must have an energy mission, not simply basic science. Fortunately, the outline of how to transition the US fusion program from a scientific research program to an energy program was laid out by both the fusion scientific community and the National Academies of Sciences in reports published over a year ago. These recommendations have now sat on a shelf for a year they should be immediately implemented. I'd especially note a few recommendations. The National Academies said we must set up national teams, including public-private partnerships to develop pilot plant designs and technology roadmaps. The community said we can start immediately building new recommended facilities like a fusion prototypic neutron source facility and high heat flux testing facilities. We must significantly expand plasma facing blanket and tritium R&D programs. So these, these new facilities and programs should be built and operated at American National Labs. And finally, DOE must also strengthen the fusion research program with new programs in underinvested areas like stellarators, inertial fusion energy, and alternate concepts. Major research universities are key partners in these programs today, and they will create the backbone, backbone of the fusion workforce. Uh, we support these, these reports and believe that it's, it's time to implement them. We think we can do them all much faster even than the reports uh, say. Second, the government must build a robust cost share program with private industry. The details of how to set up a new cost share program should be determined by DOE, but the need for it should be clear. If you wanna move fast, you place your investment with those who are already moving fast. Government funding to private fusion will ensure the industry is American made, will attract leading talent, entrepreneurs and investors to the US. Uh, I think it's pretty clear this will crowd in new investment. With sufficient funding, the result would be several new approaches to achieving breakthrough fusion. The FIA estimated that a $1 billion program would result in five or more new burning plasma experiments in the US this decade. Now let's be clear. 
Taking game-changing new technology to market is always a public-private partnership. Whether nuclear power in the 50s, military support to Silicon Valley chip makers in the 60s, commercial space in the last decade, even fracking and renewable energy. And this is not some unvetted proposal that the industry is putting out. In the spring of 2020, DOE issued an RFI on how to set up a fusion cost share program. The support was notably broad. Congress authorized this program over a year ago in the Energy Act of 2020. Draft appropriations bills in Congress right now would fund it, whether Build Back Better or FY22 appropriations. We should not wait another budget cycle to initiate this program. We're ready to move right now. Andrew, we have to uh, wrap okay. up. Then, then finally, on regulatory certainty, what I'd say is, is we, we need regulatory cer certainty and we're ready to go there. I'm working with the NRC on that. And then finally, the race is on. As Director Lander said in comments to the AGU last month about fusion, the race is on. The time to act is now. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arnold. Back to you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be many questions when we get to the discussion. We'll now turn to Katie Ray of The Engine. Great. I just want to see if you can see my screen. Yes. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you about a program that uh, a company that was really spun out of MIT to address what we think of as a real market problem. Uh, and that is how do you actually take breakthrough technology and commercialize it and breakthrough technology in an area that we call tough tech. And energy tech is dead center to that. It's the type of technology that is often very, it has a physical instantiation. It's often very cost intensive in the beginning. Um, it takes many years to develop to get to market. Something like commercial fusion is a perfect example of it. Um, and, you know, if the president of MIT and a whole group of, of leaders at MIT really set out to look at why weren't these incredible innovations really getting to market and commercialized at scale, particularly things that were solving global problems like climate change? And so the engine was spun out as a for-profit. And I'll take you through what the market corrections were that we were seeking and how we needed to work with government and the private sector to do that. So, and again, we are five years into this experiment, so we've learned a lot, but there is still much to be learned. So I don't, I don't want that to be lost on this audience. Um, in 2017, we raised the first fund in order to back the entrepreneurs and set up a system that would help them. Um, I will take you through that system in a minute. But one thing I want to point out that I think is so fundamental and such an incredible part of our innovation ecosystem in the U.S. are the people that come out of our universities. And I have the pleasure of working with founders, what I call founders on a mission, founders that know exactly why they want to develop a company, what that impact will have in the world. And one of the greatest pleasures I have is working with energy in the energy sector. So on things like commercializing fusion or how to decarbonize all of our industries or how to create cement that is completely carbon free. I mean, I, I have a hundred examples of this and I'll take you through why these entrepreneurs face a problem in commercialization and what we can do about it. But remember that we are backing people here and developing the skills of people to solve our problems. And that's very central to what the engine does. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen a valley of death slide and often it's shown as a single valley of death. When you work with entrepreneurs trying to commercialize in the energy sector, you will see that there are at least four, there might be five valleys of death. Um, and the very first one, of course, is translation from university and to out of the university, what we call translation. And that is where the engine, when we first started, focused. 
Now I bring you back to the entrepreneurs because everything that we do is centered around helping these entrepreneurs, not just get out of the first valley of death, but all the way to come through to the last valley of death until they are scaled global companies. And that is because that is when you have true impact on our biggest problems. Um, at the end of this I will come back to specific recommendations of what we can do in each valley of death. But I want you to see how important the government, and you all know this, is to creating the breakthrough technology. But then once you're in translation, the government still remains a very important partner there in many, many aspects. But so do angel investors and venture capital, state incubators, uh, tax incentives. There are many things that help that first translation happen. Um, the second piece that is also very important is you might have an early win and a really promising technology, but if you don't get through product development to really show your customers that it is possible, it won't matter. And then after that, you've got to get through your pilots and then multiple deployments. And at each phase, there are critical failure modes that we need support from the government as a partner to get through. Uh, the engine in, in our experiment that we're running determined that there were three areas of critical support that had to happen in order for the entrepreneurs to move at a pace that could be accepted by our capital markets. So if you think of something, as, it, as we were just talking about infusion, if you're talking about commercialization in 2030, you've got to start 10 plus years before that to get there. Most venture capital funds in the US are set up with a 10 year life frame. That means you can't invest into a company that won't be commercialized for 15 years. And so you have to shake up how we think about investment into these companies, but you also have to provide the infrastructure that they need to build them. So we are in an incredibly fortunate situation at the engine in that we are partnered with MIT. So we can work and provide space for these types of entrepreneurs. But this is critical. We need chemistry labs, biology labs, fabrication space, and the know-how to support multiple types of what we call tough tech companies in their commercialization path. That is not available in many parts of the US where it is cost-effective to the entrepreneur. And then the other piece that these entrepreneurs need is a very strong network. And that's a network of government know-how, commercial know-how, how to create deals. Uh, and you know, I'm also, again, very fortunate to be in this ecosystem. But if the US is going to remain competitive, this type of uh, organization needs to be associated probably with most of our research universities. Uh, and, and because it allows this type of innovation to scale very quickly, creating jobs, creating new talent pools that will sustain our economy for the next generation, um, and, and capital pools that will allow these companies to get through all their different stage gates. I'm gonna give you an example. We've been on Fusion, but I'm gonna give you an example of one of our portfolio companies, Commonwealth Fusion, that we backed very, very early as they were just spinning out of MIT. Uh, most of our government dollars in Fusion have gone into a global Fusion experiment, ITER, and uh, that left many of our scientists and graduate students really stranded because all of the funding shifted to something that was not in the labs, uh, like at MIT as an example, but there are many other examples. So this young group of, uh, of scientists and engineers decided that they would take this not as a loss, but as an opportunity 
to prove that we could get to commercialization of fusion much faster. They were using very modern techniques of simulation. They were looking at new materials for how you could build a fusion power plant faster, cheaper, so that you could get to Q greater than one in less than 15 years. And this is a very unusual and very talented group of people that might not have made it without the support of MIT or a university, government support, but also the support of private capital. And, and what I want to you know, basically challenge you all to think about is how many of these we have lost because there wasn't that tri triad of basically private, public, capital, and academic know-how. And if you look at Commonwealth Fusion, yes, it looks like an, we have the possibility to have incredible success here and create an entire fusion industry in the US. But it meant that private capital had to be put to work to spin it out and in large numbers. The first round that had to be raised out of Commonwealth Fusion was $115 million. Billion, million dollars. That's a very large sum of capital for an early stage company that has 15 years left to get to commercialization. And that is the kind of experiment and kind of company that met, needs to be backed in the US if we are going to own the next generation of energy industries. Uh, you will see that this year we just raised $1.8 billion. And you'll also see that only 7 million of that is really with R&D cap, uh, with government dollars. If you look at the ratio of that, that should seem off to most of us. Why aren't we able to back and put dollars against such a promising industry? That, that is a long-term problem for us if we don't do it, because many other countries will. And this is just one example We've seen this example over and over again in clean tech industries. If we don't invest, others will, and those industries will shift to other parts of the world. And while that may solve a problem, it will not solve equity here, great jobs, and kind of our future economy. We've seen that in the solar industry, uh, which was referenced earlier as well. So we don't want that to happen here. But in order for it to happen and remain here as an industry in the US, we are gonna have to truly lean in and make sure that the rules and regulations allow for companies like this and that we match in many ways the dollars that are being invested privately with public know-how and dollars. And I'm gonna take you through examples of that. But before I move on, I wanna give one other example this is a very different kind of company. This is Via Separations. Essentially, they're trying to take all processes that involve distillation today in industries like pulp and paper or pharmaceuticals and move it to using membranes, right? So filtering rather than dis distillation, which is very energy intensive. This is a kind of company that generally does not get backed because again, it takes a lot of years and a lot of know-how and capital even to get to your first pilot customer. But the impact they could have might be upwards of 10% of energy use reduced in each of these industries. That's enormous towards our goals of climate of reversing climate change. But hey, company you're, like you're this, to wrap up soon. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so two things. We've seen lots of money go into climate change, but many of our areas have not been invested in. So we've seen a lot in electric vehicles, but we are not seeing it broadly. So don't let that dissuade you from investing here. Then two or three things that I think we have to do. One, we must continue to invest from the U.S. perspective in entrepreneurial fellowship programs for PhD students. This is immensely important to what we do. We have to continue to match venture dollars in our SBIR programs so that these companies translate out. 
then we have to provide matching funds for pilot programs and clean energy demonstration projects. And then, of course, we also have to use our procurement arms in order to back companies like this very early. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to Armin Cohen of the Clean uh, Air Task Force. Okay. Let's see. I guess I need uh, access here. Let's see if it... There we go. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, let me go to full screen here, if I can. Yes. Um, I'm going to continue some of the commercialization themes uh, that were mentioned by previous speakers and focused on what I'm calling the gaps uh, in the decarbonization equation. Um, the gap number one that seems to call out for priority is technologies that can provide 24-7, 365 reliable electricity uh, to complement seasonably variable renewables. Uh, Harry you know, mentioned that some of the studies out there suggest a 50% uh, market share for, for PV uh, in, in a few decades. I hope that's true, but then we have to worry about the other 50%. And in particular, we have to deal with the seasonal variation of uh, wind and solar uh, um, output as represented in the left slide, which is a, a 39 year, uh, 36 year uh, kind of average uh, looking in the Northern hemisphere. You can see solar uh, is quite variable by season, you know, by a factor of, of as much as two. Um, likewise with wind uh, demand, you know, is also fluctuates, but doesn't necessarily follow supply. So we need to fill in those gaps and we need to do that inexpensively. Um, land use is an emerging issue. Um, we need things that are power dense, compact. Um, this uh, figure on the right is an analysis we did looking at the total land area required for idealized energy systems. Uh, if you did everything with offshore wind in the Eastern US, you would see the blue box uh, in uh, onshore wind, the red box with solar, the orange box. I put nuclear on there and the green box as an example, uh, not that any of these idealized scenarios are things you would actually do, but just indicate some of the issues associated with, with very large build out. And I'll return to this in a minute. So ideally we would have a toolkit of low carbon technologies that both uh, were seasonably, seasonally functional as well as compact. Um, gap number two is we need a zero carbon fuel substitute for oil and gas. Uh, today, 80% of global energy and in the US is delivered not as electricity, but as some kind of uh, gaseous or liquid fuel. Um, we need to electrify as much of that as possible, but uh, it is highly likely that there are some sectors like the ones shown here that uh, will require a more flexible um, fuel, uh, for example, high temperature heat or uh, uh, places like uh, high, heavy trucking. Um, so what are our options? Well, I, I wanna, I'll address these in detail uh, in a bit, but uh, just option number one, clearly, Carbon capture and storage for industry and for zero carbon gas power uh, would be very handy to have. Um, also carbon capture and storage for direct air capture if we end up going that direction. Um, just a couple pictures here to illustrate upper left is a functioning carbon capture unit um, on a coal plant in Texas. The upper right is a company demonstrating a, a zero carbon gas technology using CCS called Net Power. Um, uh, based in, in Texas, where the prototype shown here is. And uh, the, uh, in Abu Dhabi, you can go see a steel plant with carbon capture on the back end. So this is a technology that's you know, out there. It's not, these are not necessarily uh, cutting edge science, but we are in the commercialization zone here, uh, sort of in the middle of Katie's uh, spectrum. Um, option number two um, for this 24-7, 365 and energy dense uh, opportunity space is uh, advanced past to deploy manufacturable nuclear fission. I'll return to that in a minute. Um, another option to put on the table, not as well discussed, is deep super hot geothermal. This is going beyond conventional geothermal deposits into deep hot rock, injecting water and harvesting supercritical steam. One of the advantages of this approach is that it's almost ubiquitous on the planet. Um, unlike uh, conventional geothermal, which is confined to the orange and red zones, anything here that's dark blue or yellow has this kind of resource available. This is very high temperature steam that can be used to create electricity at low cost or, um, or, or fuels. Um, finally, hydrogen and ammonia, uh, as we mentioned, uh, we do need a zero, zero carbon liquid fuel solution. Many ways to do that. 
natural gas reforming plus carbon capture, nuclear energy uh, or renewables. Um, you know, I'm going to concentrate here on the right end of the spectrum. Uh, you know, we, we heard some earlier conversations about R&D, um, but I'm going to focus for a moment on what we might do to, to have the sort of wide scale uh, deployment and what are the success factors in that process. I'm going to emphasize lower costs, fast project deployment, easy access to capital, and what I'll call ecosystem challenges. Um, to address those issues, there are, uh, are a variety of, of policy design principles. I'll just tick them off very quickly and then show you how they apply to some of these sectors. Innovation is going to probably require a suite of policies addressing all stages, not just early stage R&D. Um, we have to expand, of course, the technology options through better and more R&D, as was suggested earlier. But R&D also must begin with the end in mind. If we're going to be relevant to global climate, we need things that are inexpensive and fast to deploy. And uh, so we need to have that in the mind in mind from the beginning of the design of these programs. Um, commercial demonstration projects uh, can't be just one of a kind, first, first of a kind, one offs. Uh, we have to think about getting through nth of a kind to get the scale and learning. Um, we should have policies for wide scale deployment that are simple, certain and wide scale. We need to create supporting ecosystems. It's not just the gizmos. It's all things like permitting and building the infrastructure that we need, whether it's generation, transmission pipelines, storage sites, and we have to have clear regulatory and commercial rules that can get things to market. Um, finally, we need to approach this as a global effort. Uh, while it is true that US is an innovation engine, if our solutions are gonna matter globally, they're gonna have to be inexpensive and be able to scale quickly. Um, just a couple of ways to apply those principles. With carbon capture and storage, we've actually got a pretty good start in the US. Uh, we have an existing program that values uh, carbon storage. Uh, the current uh, Build Back Better Act uh, contemplates an increase in those credit values along with direct pay and uh, extending the com commenced construction window, which will be critical to get to commercial scale. Um, we need a program that provides continued and consistent funding, not just for the first of a kind of such projects, but maybe the fourth or fifth so that we can get those that learning. Um, and finally, we need to kind of figure out how to do dedicated investment in CO trans, CO2 transport and storage. We need to think about basin scale management and strategic plan for offshore storage, uh, seabed storage. Um, super hot geothermal priorities, uh, we think include establishing a dedicated program, including a national lab focused on super hot rock geothermal research and development, uh, something in the order of $30 million uh, per fiscal year for five years. and. Uh, in particular, a $70 million per fiscal year program to support super hot rock power production demonstrations. Um, advanced nuclear fission, I'm not going to go through all this list. The, the general principle here is that uh, while advanced fission has substantial promise um, to aid in climate and energy access, we really need a, 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 a phase shift, a fundamental uh, shift in the way we do this. Costs need to come down dramatically. Deployment needs to be sped up from the 10 gigawatts globally that we're doing right now to probably 100 plus gigawatts per year. We need to move from projects um, to essentially a commoditized product, not unlike aircraft, um, for example. Um, so the, I'm going to just highlight a couple of things under each of the buckets. R&D, we really need R&D focused on pathways to significant cost reduction and schedule um, uh, uh, compression. Um, you know, right now that's not the focus. We, we kind of fund all comers. Uh, you know, our view is that you need a cost target and you need to have your R&D program disciplined to uh, technologies that can meet those kinds of toss, cost targets. Um, variety of other things in, in this space, uh, accelerated uh, research on low dose radiation, which is, lies at the heart of regulation in this space. Uh, again, in demonstration, prioritize designs with inherent capability and a clear line of sight to very low cost. Uh, supporting again multiple builds of designs, not just first of a kind, so that we uh, end up with uh, white elephants uh, that someone tries and then never tries again because of the cost overrun on the first units. Um, in terms of deployment, there's some good uh, things in the Build Back Better bill, should it pass um, for advanced nuclear. There's some other ways that the federal government can support this. We'd be happy to talk in more detail. And then finally, infrastructure and what I'll call ecosystem issues. Uh, we need to continue to support and push the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do the regulation that's suitable for advanced designs, not looking in the rear view mirror at uh, conventional light water designs. And finally, we need to reset on nuclear waste. Um, and that's a long topic, but fundamentally what we've tried has failed. 
uh, Finland and Sweden have pointed the way to something that makes more sense, but we're really gonna have to turn the clock back and pretty much start over in our opinion. On zero carbon fuels, a variety of things, I'll just tick off very quickly. We need a regional clean hydrogen hub program expansion. Uh, the uh, infrastructure bill had a good start here, but again, we need to double that. Incentives for broad-based product, broad production of zero carbon fuels. We need to demonstrate hydrogen extraction uh, using nuclear at larger scale, um, marine sector uh, decarbonization. Uh, and uh, a variety of other uh, very specific uh, uh, demonstration programs. One particular area that's important is to demonstrate uh, very, very low NOx combustion of hydrogen. Um, uh, hydrogen is a byproduct, uh, nitrogen is a, NOx is a byproduct of current um, hydrogen combustion technologies and we need, really need to cram that down so we don't not have local air pollution problems as well as contributions to global climate change. Um, finally, um, we need cross-cutting focus on com the commercial and, and deployment needs. In particular, I alluded to spatial awareness, the need for planning. On the right is a picture of what the United States looks like under these zero carbon plans. This is from uh, uh, Steve's uh, project at Princeton, uh, the Net Zero America project. And you can see with the wind and blue and the uh, orange dots, which you can't see very well on this resolution, uh, and the, the transmission lines that need to be built, uh, you can see that we're fundamentally industrializing the US landscape. This is not going to be an easy thing to do. And we're already experiencing in places like California, uh, a lot of uh, friction um, in siting infrastructure, um, even things that are arguably quite popular like photovoltaics um, uh, are, are experiencing, at, at least at the scale that we need to go here, we're talking about an expansion of something like three fold um, uh, in, in uh, total transmission capacity and maybe uh, a four to five uh, X uh, increase in, in total electric generation capacity. Um, our view is that there needs to be thought given to some kind of spatial planning, sequential planning, uh, reuse of existing energy and non-energy brownfield sites. Um, finally, targeted R&D around innovative transmission approaches would be extremely helpful. Things like reconductoring, undergrounding, corridor repurposing, and superconducting. Uh, so that's a lot to do, but uh, without the sort of social, spatial, logistical ecosystem stuff, we think the gizmos um, are, are not going to save the day. So I'll end there and we can discuss that more in, in questions. Thank you. You've given us a great deal to think about. Uh, now we'll move to Jigar Shah of the DOE. Thank you. Um, it's uh, extraordinary to follow uh, Armand, given that our presentations are so similar. So <laughs> you may see some of this stuff again. Um, for those of you who haven't kept up with the Loan Programs Office, um, it was, as the secretary described in her confirmation hearing, dormant for the better part of the last 10 years. Um, I think since uh, she has been confirmed, we are now back up to um, $7 billion of applications per month, um, roughly 2.3 uh, applications uh, submitted a week. Um, really, I think in order to inform, you know, effective outreach and origination, um, LPO really needs to have a much broader perspective on the deployment pathways for these technologies, right? Because we're taking 20 to 30 year uh, bets on the technologies. Um, Separately, I guess, as the deployment arm of the U.S. Department of Energy, we have played a very large role in shaping the department's broader views and actions, enabling the energy transition, right? Really helping these technologies that are uh, fully lab scale proven uh, really get to full commercialization. Today, we have applications across 20, uh, over 20, uh, 23 to be specific, uh, technology verticals that require us to identify immediate actions U.S. government can take to support capital formation in each of these sectors. Um, I think it's important to note that putting loans out the door really doesn't solve the problem. The, all of the policies that we're talking about today from all of the speakers are really around capital formation. Any substantial um, change that we will make to our climate change really requires a trillion dollars of capital. And that's what we've attracted in the solar, We've attracted that into wind, we've attracted that into EV infrastructure and manufacturing, and now we've attracted that into lithium ion battery storage. And so anything short of a trillion doesn't get you to gigaton scale. And so, so what we're doing is really thinking about how 
the DOE's limited funds and LPO's limited funds really provides that form of capital formation. This is our existing portfolio. Um, we've dispersed about 30 billion to borrowers. We've had 11 billion of principal repayment. We generate around uh, $500 million of um, interest uh, per year uh, to the federal treasury. And we've had a low aggregate loss rate of roughly 3% of funds dispersed, which is roughly the same as commercial banks. Um, even though our average uh, loan is rated single B or double B, which reflects the early stage in which we come through. Uh, you can see that our average loan is quite high, 940 million, uh, largely dominated by two large loans, um, the Ford loan for, for advanced technology vehicle manufacturing and the Bodo nuclear plant loan. And our median loans roughly 532 million. Um, I wanna spend a little time on this slide, the bridge to bankability. So the way that we view our role is we take proven technologies here on the left, which of which DOE has been quite prolific over the last 40 years. Um, and we really get them into the first milestone, which is here applied engineering, which frankly, I would say is atrophied in, in a great way here in the United States. Um, our applied engineering capabilities um, as seen in you know, some of the projects that Armand talked about um, has uh, not been as, as good as it was 30 or 40 years ago. Um, in that vein, um, we, you know, we are doing a lot of the applied engineering analysis to these projects and providing that, that money to there. And then we partner with the new Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations and others. The next milestone really is around uh, EPC uh, excellence, right? Finding ways to reduce risk and decrease cost, um, mostly through traditional engineering procurement and construction firms of which we have many here in the United States. The third is really what we call the learning curve you know, area, which is commercial scale up. And that's where you're really establishing demand. And that's where the secretary's earth shots uh, fit in. You're talking about six to seven cumulative doublings of deployment required to really re reduce costs. And the fourth one, which is often overlooked is basically gaining Wall Street interest. Um, the difference between milestone three and milestone four is quite substantial. Um, so in 2015, 2016, when you would have thought the solar wind technologies were really mature, you were still seeing debt interest rates at somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 6%. And today those interest rates are at 2%. And that's the difference between gaining full securitization in Wall Street and not having full securitization in Wall Street. So in milestone three, most of that debt sits on commercial balance sheets, where in milestone four, most of that debt is sold off to pension funds and uh, other large securitization uh, insurance companies, et cetera. And so what we've done is we brought in about 50 uh, private sector folks into LPO since last March. And we engaged directly with private sector CEOs uh, with the help of many of the folks here on the call uh, to really identify chicken and egg challenges, uh, revolving permitting and regulatory issues, lack of critical government resources. And so in advanced nuclear, um, we have you know, really uh, put our shoulder to the grindstone here and working with electric utilities and others to really make real what Armand presented um, today. And I'd say as a result, we'll have the first few um, nuclear plans announced uh, here um, in the second quarter um, by the electric utility industry. You know, and we're hoping to have many more announced by the end of the year. Uh, we need 10 announcements um, both here in the United States and internationally of each design to be able to justify the supply chain investments that we have the right to do. And we think we will achieve that um, here by the end of the year. Um, on transmission, we're identifying interventions directly with governors, regional transmission operators, and HVDC technology folks. I mean, the United States still has no HVDC um, best practices hub. All of those uh, are based in either like Siemens or ABB or GE have one, and then um, you know Canada has one, but we still don't have one here in the United States. So we have to stand one of those up to be able to support multiple HVDC line deployments. Um, and virtual power plants, um, most people who um, are below you know, 680 FICO score are currently not being served. And largely that's because um, the losses from that loan pool are perceived to be at around 35% when in fact the real data has shown less than 17% losses. Um, and so we've done a lot of work to, to uh, solve that problem and we'll have 
most of that, I think, um, solved by the end of the year. Um, in critical minerals, we've, um, over the last three years, mapped most of the major projects here in the United States. And it's important to note the difference between the loan programs office and others, is that we're not doing theoretical work for us um, when we do the mapping, we have to identify an actual private sector sponsor who is actually, you know, filed for permits at the site and is ready to actually start mining. Um, so these are not theoretical numbers, but actually numbers that could be um, brought on board here in the next two to five years. On offshore wind, um, we've really been filling the communication gaps between states and industry um, with our dollars as well. Uh, for instance, there's only eight ideal locations to connect offshore wind to the East Coast. If we waste any one of those eight locations with radial lines, uh, which we are at risk of doing, then we'll only be able to use it for 1,500 megawatts of interconnection as opposed to 7,000 megawatts of interconnection if you were to do it with an HVDC line. And so we're playing a pretty big role there. Also, the president has pushed for Jones Act compliant ships. Frankly, we would need them anyway, just because there aren't enough extra ships to lend from Europe, even if he provided a waiver. And uh, the coordination to make sure that all of our shipyards and foreign shipyards are making Jones Act compliant ships um, are something that we're driving out of the loan programs office. And hydrogen, no one knows what a hub means. And so we're leading the charge on figuring out what a hub means for everybody. It's shocking to me how little coordination is happening in our industrial centers around creating hubs. Most of what people are doing that look like hubs or they call hubs are actually just bilateral contracts between a producer and a user, which I would not view as a hub and the legislation also does not define as a hub. We're also um, working pretty hard on the 85Q uh, uh, proposal that's in the Build Back Better Act, which um, uh, currently does not include all forms of clean hydrogen. And so we're working on the definitions there. Um, and on biofuels, um, most of those projects for sustainable aviation fuels in particular are bilateral contracts between one producer and one airline. You can imagine that creates lots of credit risk. Um, it's better for all those airlines to fit into a buying pool that then would be uh, the off taker for each one of those plants. So we're working closely with DOT and others to put that in place. Um, to date, we've got, uh, as of December 31st, we have 77 active applications. $60 billion, 2.3 uh, new applications per week on a 24 week average. Uh, you see the boxes on the right uh, is where uh, most of those applications have come in, including uh, carbon capture and utilization, uh, advanced vehicle manufacturing, critical minerals, hydrogen. Uh, we're getting a lot more EV charging applications coming in, battery storage, virtual power plants, as, as well as advanced fossil fuels. This data is shared on our website and we update it. Uh, monthly. Uh, ramping up in 2022, uh, we had our first conditional commitment, which I'll talk about a little later in the presentation uh, in December. Uh, these are the areas where we expect conditional commitments to be issued in 2022. Uh, and they range from uh, the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing program with battery gigafactories, uh, critical minerals, EV manufacturing. We have several industrial decarbonization projects um, offshore wind supply chain, hydropower, uh, as well as pumped hydropower, um, hydrogen projects. We have uh, our first uh, loans out of the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program, which is exciting. We have several large transmission lines that have come into the loan program's office, um, as well as uh, a variety of different applications around energy storage, as, as well as a variety of different chemistries for battery storage uh, outside of lithium ion. Um, and our first uh, conditional commitment that we provided last month was to Monolith Materials. Monolith is putting their plant in Halem, Nebraska. You can imagine um, they are tackling two of the hardest to decarbonize sectors uh, in the United States. One is carbon black, which we all use on tires, including for electric vehicles. And two is um, uh, ammonia, which is dominated by the Haber-Bosch process, which many know uh, is a huge breakthrough around the Green Revolution, but also a huge source of carbon emissions and not one with a ready uh, and easy way to reduce carbon emissions. Um, this facility, once constructed and fully ramped up, um, should be able to produce carbon black at a 30% discount to the market today, as well as produce ammonia um, because at, at a very low cost because 
they will be producing hydrogen at the secretary's um, hydrogen shot uh, cost uh, profile, which is a dollar per kilogram. Uh, and this is, and, and it, as you may know, this is a carbon black reactor using a plasma arc torch. And so we're physically breaking the bond using electricity, which will come from clean sources um, between the carbon and the hydrogen. Uh, and so the carbon becomes uh, physical carbon and that gets turned into carbon black. So there are no appreciable uh, greenhouse gas emissions from this process. Um, on the justice side, um, these are all the existing carbon black plants. As of 2013, none of them have installed scrubbers of any sort. They're all under consent decrees with EPA and justice because of the pollution that they produce in local communities. And several carbon black manufacturers have said that they may decide to shut down their plants instead of installing uh, emissions controls. On the greenhouse gas emission side, um, the vast majority of the emissions are calculated to come from methane leakage. Um, we uh, used uh, average methane leakage amounts here, um, but we are mandating that they use low leak methane. Um, as many folks know, there are many low leak methane standards that have come up across the United States. The DOE is leading um, a single low leak methane standard that will rule them all this year. And, um, and Monolith has agreed to use that uh, standard um, uh, once it is established. With that, I will give it back to you to make up time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes until we're joined by White House Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy. So I would just say, let's start the discussion. And I see several hands up. Laura, we can start with you. I just have a quick question about the most recent time. By the way, these talks were huge, wonderful, very clear, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question uh, about uh, the carbon black. Um, one of the things that we do at the Magnet Lab is we differentiate between the forever PFAS chemicals and not, and, and uh, dissolved organic carbon or dissolved organic, any kind of uh, materials. And do you have a way to differentiate which of the ones are going to be the forever chemicals? Do you think it's important? I think it's important to look into that. And, and what will be polluting our ground and air for a very long time? And if you transforming this carbon into a less uh, polluting form of carbon that can be removed from the atmosphere or soil or water. Yeah, so the carbon from the monolith uh, system um, is immediately captured as physical carbon, right? So it doesn't turn into CO2 or any other molecules. It just stays as carbon black. And then it's transformed into a form that can be uh, bought by Goodyear, Michelin, others, and put into tires. And so you do have some, you know, um, you know, wear and tear that occurs on your tires, but the carbon black is sequestered permanently. Let's discuss this later because I'm worried more about the PFAS aspect of it that whether you can separate that. Sure, happy to. Okay, thank you. Probably goes into some details of the different processes. Eric Corbett. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the fabulous talks. So maybe just to direct a, a comment or question to Katie and, and Jigar, where are we with milestone-based programs uh, with fusion? Um, it's not clear to me that we have anything akin to uh, privatization of, of space, for example, with what was done with milestones there for fusion. Did I jump on that too? Uh, sure. <laughs> go for it, yeah, Andrew. Go for it. Uh, so, so that yeah, that is exactly what what we are actively pushing for uh, in Build Back Better. In the House passed Build Back Better bill, there was three hundred twenty five million dollars for a milestone based program. Um, it would largely be, you know, the way we see it is kind of modeled on COTS or SMR program from DOE or various other, even ARDP. Uh, there's there's various models for doing it. Uh, we're excited for it, hoping it gets gets ramped up and set up soon. Uh, I think it's it is this is the way of the future to do public private partnerships. It is you know doing it the way the private sector funds 
programs. You meet a milestone, then you go back and you raise more money you, to, to get to your next milestone. You don't commit to, to the whole thing at once and all of the dollars at once. This is a pay for performance and meet that there. And so it's a, you know, our, our, our goal is a 50-50 cost share. You know, we're ready to, to, to do it right now. Thanks. Jugar, would you like to address that? Yeah, I mean, all of the loans at the loan programs office are structured exactly that way. So we already do that. We have milestone-based disbursements mm -hmm. and as they meet the milestones, we put them out. And many of these technologies in the first of a kind space may take two or three years to meet all the milestones. Yeah, I just didn't see advanced nuclear, including fusion. Well, I mean, fusion qualifies for our office. I'd say that fusion, you know, I appreciate all the progress fusion has made, right? But ultimately it's not a commercial product, right? Yeah. So it, even the word commercial viability is sort of a false flag in fusion. It means that it produces one kilowatt hour over what it takes to make it. And so I think that yeah. when it actually really commercializes, we'll talk about milestones around deployment and integration into Got the it. grid. And I'm a big fan of where we're headed, but you know, I don't think we're planning yet for fusion. We're not ready for you yet, Jake. But but we'll we'll come we'll come when we are. I appreciate seeing the results. Okay. Joe Chiani. Thank you. Uh, great presentations. Geothermal seems like a great opportunity to reduce our heating and cooling costs. The deep geothermal, the hot deep ones, seem like a great opportunity to also avert some dangers, like you hear about uh, the Yellowstone geyser. Um, but, but I guess I have a question. Are there opportunities to go to the ones that look like they could blow and cause harm in harnessing the energy and diffusing its power? And then if we go too far, are there issues surrounding taking the heat out of the core of our earth? Yeah, well, I'm gonna use Andrew's uh, caveat, which is I'm not, the, I'm not the geologist on our staff, so I'm going to get back to you on, on both of those questions. Um, but, uh, you know, again, on the first question, we're really talking about existing accessible geothermal pools, you know, and what I was talking about was essentially artificial geothermal by injecting water into hot rock. Um, I think that's a really interesting question about extraction of heat. And I, I mean, if you can say something more about what, what are the knock-on effects of, of, of the heat extraction? I mean, well, maybe. well, I know when we extract oil, we cause earthquakes around. Okay, so areas. So taking the heat out, <laughs> what could that mean to the future of the Earth? Maybe we'll cool it off, which will be good at the beginning. But uh, what could uh, what, I, I'm, I'm told this is an uh, ignorant question. I don't know, but I thought uh, I'd ask. Well, I, I will. So, I will make sure to get back to you on that. The, the The question of induced seismicity is one that I left off the the list, and very careful management of the of the reservoirs and the pressurizing of those reservoirs is, is gonna be also a critical R&D and demonstration uh, milestone, but I'll, I'll make sure we get back to you on we that. We have a PCAST I expert could, here who would like I, to. Well, I could, yeah, I mean, I, I could talk about uh, accessing the core part. You know, the deepest borehole we've drilled on the earth is about 12 kilometers and the, the core is half the radius of the earth. So we're a far, 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 far away from being able to access the core. Yeah, and the other thing I could say is for the advanced geothermal projects that we're looking to deploy, um, the drilling equipment that's low cost only gets you to about 1.6 kilometers. And, the, and, the, um, and two of them are on active volcanoes and they still stay active. So we don't actually help reduce their activity. And you saw that in spectacular form on the Big Island when when the volcano actually destroyed our mass geothermal facility. Thank you, Steve. So, so I have uh, one question for Armand and one for uh, Jigar. Uh, for Armin, um, it looked to me like um, all but the spatial planning um, um, uh, needs that you talked about were needs that are sort of consistent with what the session is about, and that is the need for long-term development. You can think of this as, as what's needed after Biden's second term, right? Stuff, technologies that need to come into the 
to the marketplace then. But the spatial planning one looked to me like it's something that needs to be solved now because it would endanger getting to the 2030 goals even. Is that right or did I miss that? A hundred percent. I mean, I, we're on the ground in California now working with stakeholders. And uh, just to give you some sense of that, uh, Steve, so the goal by 2045 is for them to have a uh, hundred, some the Princeton model would suggest something like 200 gigawatts of, of central PV. California has implemented 14 gigawatts and they're, they're permitting at about something under one gigawatt per year. So you go do the math. And a lot of that just has to do with all kinds of bottlenecks around transmission permitting. Some of it is, is ordinances beginning to be enacted to restrict large scale solar development. This is a problem we have to start solving yesterday. Um, absolutely. And uh, I, I, I seriously don't, I think if we do not get on this right away, I, I, I think even these interim goals are very much in danger as I think most people in California would now, now acknowledge. Yeah, and I've ridden this horse before, but I just want to remind PCAST that, you know, the other big objective uh, around the energy transition is to make it more inclusive, to make it fairer, to make it have a higher degree of justice. And all of that requires, at least according to the way that we normally do things, a more consultative process, which would slow it down even more. And so I think this really is the central impediment. I agree with Armand there. Uh, Jigger, I wanted to just follow up on your comment that there's no nobody's producing a hydrogen hub proposal. I know all these companies that are producing hydrogen hub proposals. Uh, w- w- when you say there's no hydrogen hub, are there any examples in the world that would qualify in your mind as a hydrogen hub, like the Teesside project in the UK or yeah. anything in Northern Europe? Are those hubs? Well, I'm not. So I apologize if I meant to say that there's no hydrogen projects happening. I'd say there's a few in the U.S. and there's definitely the one in the U.K. that's great. I'd, I'd say Louisiana, probably Houston and L.A. are being the most thoughtful. I'd say the vast majority of other industrial hubs in the United States, whether it's Chicago or Pittsburgh or Ohio River Valley or others, are not yet on track to putting together thoughtful applications. And I think it's going to be crucial for all of us to help them figure out what that looks like um, to do that. Um, uh, the one other thing I would say on the previous question is that um, what, you know, what happens when we don't figure out this NIMBY problem that we're faced with is that it does lead you to then go to nuclear fission. I mean, that is where it leads you, right? Because you've got 200 existing coal plants of which 77 have already been determined to be ideal for NRC um, approval and, um, and and then natural gas plants as well that are that are being decommissioned from the 90s and those sites will be much easier to put in nuclear plants than other things if you can't site new transmission right remember like nuclear plants are basically like using the HOV lane for existing transmission capacity and you know renewable energy is more like using you know single passenger cars. And so if we fill up the roads with single passenger cars, we're gonna have to build new transmission to be able to decarbonize the country. And I don't think, there are a lot of players, particularly in the environmental organizations who understand this now, but um, it it is coming very quickly on top of us. Yeah, can I make a comment on the the hubs? Um, There actually are two examples in Europe, the Porthos um, project in the Netherlands and the Northern Lights project, I believe in Norway, that are attempting to integrate multiple companies, multiple sources of hydrogen production, natural gas primarily, and and offshore wind, and then combining it with CCS from industry. Again, these are still paper plans, um, but they do do represent kind of trying to create an industrial ecosystem around hydrogen production on the one hand and industrial decarbonization on the other. Uh, I regret that the US is behind on this. Europe has been on this for like four or five years. Uh, so well, again, it's uh, it's a little more than that, though, Armand. I just want to make sure I un- that everyone understands the nuance here is that Europe actually understands and relishes a public-private partnership framework. We don't here in the United States, right? A public-private partnership framework in its real form, not the form that we describe it as, is actually a regulatory framework. So it is something like akin to the regulations that we provide to the natural gas and electric utility industry, 
where every year they can say, here's what our costs were. We would like an adjustment in our price. That is not how these hubs are coming together. And that is a huge problem because most of them are coming together with private sector players that have investment grade credits, which is great. But a lot of the emissions are coming from industrial sources, from companies who don't have investment grade credits. And to connect them, you are going to have to have something that looks like a monopoly license from the state. And I don't actually know of anyone who's really thinking about putting that type of framework together or handing this off to the natural gas utility as its next act. Fair enough. Very good. Bill Press? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is a question maybe mainly to Kate. Katie, but possibly also Jigar. Um, we, we hear about the need for patient investors, and it seems to me that, that you've put together at scale a set of very patient it investors. And I wonder whether you've studied them or whether you have brought in economists to study them in any sense. In particular, um, how sensitive are they going to be to interest rates? Because um, you know, if, if interest rates are zero, you can discount to the present rewards that are 15 years away and they look like they're tomorrow. But if interest rates are 5%, then that's no longer true. So, so I wonder whether, are, are you counting on this supply of patient investors in an uncertain future? Well, I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> that's the golden, you just asked the golden question. And I certainly don't have an answer to to how markets will behave or how all investors will behave. I think technology is a long-term, very important bet that has a lot of growth in it. And so often people think it is a hedge to inflation, uh, but there, there are many smarter people than me on this topic. I will say that I think the investors that are committed to this type of investment care both about financial returns and the impact that they're having. And there are very few other ways to get both um, because you have to look at things that have massive markets, energy being certainly one of those, uh, not the only one, and uh, things that could be scaled globally and, uh, and that could hit the costs that need to be hit in order to be a profitable business. And so uh, when you look at something that could have that massive of a market, like a company that could have a trillion dollar market cap, um, it is okay to be patient to get to that. Uh, and you can, you can model financial returns that make a lot of sense even in if interest rates change. So obviously there are limits to what I'm saying. Um, if we have 20% inflation, that's gonna to be tough on basically uh, all of these companies. But uh, I think in general, it is a hedge to that. But Jigger, yeah. I defer to you as well. <laughs> well, look, I think when Katie was putting together her fund and you know she and I uh, checked in several times there when she was doing it, um, you know, she was really a trailblazer on putting that together and, and we all thank her for that. I think that today, I would say all of this money is patient money. I mean, how could you possibly justify putting $60 billion of venture capital into this sector last year, right? Unless you're patient, right? Those people are not gonna get their returns in three years. And the same thing's true with Tesla investors, right? I mean, Apple has a PE ratio of 28. Tesla has a PE ratio of 308. And so that means that they, by definition, are being patient for the cash flows that Tesla will produce in the future. So I do think that, that while Katie you know, had to do an extraordinary amount of work to put together her first investors, there are many, many people who piled on knowing that it's a 10-year wait for them to really get to their pot of gold. Eric, I don't see Gina McCarthy yet, so. I'll jump in. Jump in. Uh, first, huge thanks. Those were an amazing <laughs> series of talks. Really, really just great. And, and um, I'm going to listen to them again on the website because they were really good. But I did have a question for Jigger um, because maybe it, it made me appreciate, I don't quite understand the nature of things like the COTS program where you give milestones to people. Because 
You made a comment with fusion that I've been turning over in my head where you where you know you were indicating, well, I don't know if this is really commercial yet, et cetera. But in a in a milestone program, one way to do it is to say, we'll pay you a real big milestone if you have a commercially relevant plant demonstration plant that's net positive energy by a factor of whatever. It doesn't cost you a penny if they can't do it, but it changes the economics of investors who know that they'll get a return when they reach that point. So yeah. why isn't, is that a kind of, of, of a COTS program that you could make? Because you don't have to be a believer. You're, in fact, you're happy we to say, prove me wrong. Yeah, so we do that now. Okay. Right? But there's a but but I but I think that the point I was making on fusion, and you I mean I'm a huge fan of fusion in the world. Okay, I know this was what we're doing so the program. But I but I do think that we 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 gray things over at our peril, right? There are things that are actually commercial in the sense that I actually have a customer and a buyer, and then there are things that I don't have that for. So for instance. Lake Charles methanol plant, we provided milestone agreement to in 2015. They still haven't met the milestones, right? And you know, when you think about where Maersk is right now, where they've built a methanol ship and they're waiting to buy green methanol, which they can't find to put into that thing, right? It'd be great for Lake Charles methanol to meet their milestones and build this facility so that Maersk can buy their green methanol. So we're doing that now, right? But on fusion, right, what I need is an electric utility that is going to buy the fusion plant, even if it's for 2040, right, put it into their integrated resource plan and say to their public service commissioners that we are going to do this because we're going to have a center of excellence on fusion here and all these other things. And here's the I'm, I'm not getting it. it. I'm, I'm missing the point. I don't know exactly why the United States needs an electric utility that's going to buy it if you think there's a series of milestones that represent, in whatever technology we're talking about, major achievements that move us along. You have the ability to change the economics of investment yeah. in risky technologies. And it seems to me that you're, you're tied rather tightly to, do I have a final commercial company right now who wants to go purchase it? Whereas I see you as sitting on money that can unlock innovation in different spaces. And it, it sounds like you're being real conservative about that. Well, you know, I've been accused of worse. So I appreciate that. Well, but I'm I think, saying it, I'm, you know, I, I'm pushing you because I think- No, no, I, are, I yeah. appreciate that, Eric. And I'm happy to work with you to try to figure this out. But I do think it's important for the loan programs office to actually have a customer. And that customer could be, by the way, the U.S., government. It could be Idaho National Laboratories. It could be the Defense Ooh. Department, right? But it can't be like we have, as Katie suggested in her slides, we have different valleys of death, right? Yep. And Fusion absolutely needs help today to, to demonstrate commercial viability and then to demonstrate that they can actually create actual commercial viability. And that's wonderful, right? And, and we are talking to all the fusion folks already at the loan programs mm -hmm. office, including Commonwealth. And I think they're amazing, right? But if I were to say to Commonwealth, well, who's your first customer gonna be? Like, who would it even theoretically be? What application would you do? Would you be selling the thermal off your plant? Like, how would this even look in yeah, some way, shape I or form? I those questions, but... <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, I think, standard... Actually, let me stick with Jigger and then I'm going to give it back to Francis here. But okay. you so, know, why don't we take it offline there? Yes. I do want to okay. understand how we make, you know, and I don't care whether it's fusion or anything actually, else, just how you make actually, it. Actually, uh, um, Climate Advisor McCarthy's on. She's got a hard stop in a few minutes. This is a fascinating conversation. And Andrew gets the next, Andrew Holland gets the next word as soon as we're finished with. Advisor McCarthy, is that all right? Cool. Very good. <laughs> Welcome, Gina. Are you there? I am here, and Francis, I'm amazed. Eric never shuts up, even when I tell him to. <laughs> no, for Gina, I shut up. <laughs> well, Francis, thank you for for uh, letting me join today. And as everybody knows. Eric is a brilliant and really interesting human being. So uh, we've had nothing but 
joyous occasions to share lots of ideas together. And so it's wonderful to be back um, talking to PCAST again. Um, first of all, I should just thank you for hanging around and doing what you do. I really appreciate it. Um, as you could tell from the time the president spent yesterday, you know, he really cares about this and he understands the value of getting all of you together. And I certainly understand the value of your time. So thanks for giving me just a, a few minutes. And, and I can already tell that you've had some interesting conversations. So, you know, I just thought uh, for a while, I'd, I'd not just say thank you um, for, for the return engagement after October, but also talk a little bit about some of our thinking on tackling the climate crisis, which is all stop obviously what I think about day and night. Um, and it's it, 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 the framing that the president uses on this, which he may or may not have shared, is what attracted me to this job and what gives me real hope for the future. And that is that we are dealing obviously with an existential challenge, a challenge which he calls sort of a, a, a code red but it also is an incredible opportunity to fundamentally rethink the economy in the United States so we can grab the economy of the future instead of continually relying on tweaking the past. And so that's what's really exciting because what you're talking about today is really accelerating innovation in economies, in particular the enemy, uh, the energy economies. And I think that is is the central core mission of what is going to be the difference between us doing better and making big leaps forward in the time that science demands. And so I am hugely excited about this effort because we already know we have lots of clean energy technologies available to us. We're pushing those every step of the way. We're making some significant progress and and fast tracking offshore wind and, and solar energy. I mean, those things are moving forward. Of course, we have challenges, but, but we know where that can head and we have opportunities. But even as we really focus on deploying what we already have, you know, the challenge is that we don't have a defined pathway to net zero economy in 2050. I, I don't, you know, we think we're doing great, but it has to be a path that leads to something, a path that we can agree, all of us, that this is the most promising way in which we might achieve our overall goal. And we have to get there, not just through innovation, but in ways that lower the costs across the board and that develop all the kinds of cutting edge technologies that will get us there in a way that's going to allow us to legitimately say it's building our economy, not bringing it down. And so that's the challenge that we're all facing. And I, and I think if, if all goes well, we just have the opportunities for breakthroughs. But what PCAS can bring to the table is what should we be focused on? What are the next best thing that we can think about? And how do we achieve that? We have to get zero carbon energy technologies for sure, which means clean electricity, but also clean fuels, clean feedstocks. We need storage technologies that we can rely on. We need to look at early stage research and prototyping, which is the beginning of this next phase of, of what we wanna work on. And we have to look at all the amazing work that's going on in our national laboratories to see where those startups really are starting up. How do we use what they've learned through partnerships with the university sector as well as the private sector to really deploy technologies that are best and brightest at the scale that the science demands. And, and I don't wanna suggest that it's easy, but I do wanna suggest that we have a lot of opportunity and we need your guidance in terms of what is the best opportunity and how do we capture it? What are those really terrific cutting edge things that we're seeing being developed at DOE and how do we then use the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations and the new Office of Deployment at the Department of Energy to really start working 
through the process that we all know can be tediously painful and long and accelerate that, that deployment and get there as quickly as possible. So I, I think we're going to have to rely on many of you to, to use your judgment about what will get us where we need to go at the speed that we need it. We need to start developing plans for the speeding of that commercialization from the most promising. And, and one of the ways in which I think we have sent terrific signals about, about the technologies that we see that are ready for advancement is to, is to set some bold targets and then to collaborate with the research community and our industry partners. Because when we set targets, people start rallying around that. People see that as a signal about where this country wants to head, what our values are, what our opportunities are, and, and where the investments are likely to come from that's going to move this forward. You know, I, I look at, at the DOE's earth, uh, energy earth shots on clean hydrogen and long duration storage. Those, that's kind of signal sending that we, we want to have, but we really need to move forward with very uh, maybe boringly routine things like how do we get sustainable aviation fuels? If you could tell me that in a couple of minutes, I'd really appreciate it. But I think it might take a little longer than that. But we've challenged the industry to take a look at it and to set some near-term goals for 2030 that will get us on some path forward. And we know we won't get there easily, but we know we will not get there at all without the creativity and the smarts that are sitting on PCAS. And so I really appreciate your willingness to serve we really need to move to the next set of innovations and, and everything from, as I said, aviation fuels to domestic manufacturing so that we can keep moving our jobs forward. You know, the best thing ever, I think that the president did was to tell the American people and show them that climate is not a planetary problem. It is a people problem. It is a challenge for them. And if we think of it, as, as the biggest opportunity we have to actually grow jobs, to advance a more equitable society by investing in the communities that have been left behind and find the path forward together, then I think that we can maintain an engagement around this with the privates, with the public, as well as the private sector that gives us that sweet spot to not just identify the best and brightest technologies, but to really show what our values are in this country and how we can deliver those in ways that make people's lives better. You know, the president didn't think lightly when he used the term build back better. He meant it. If all we do is to continue to plod along as we are, we will be running in circles instead of running fast and grabbing the 21st century economy for us. So I think at that, I want to shut up and, and let, let uh, Francis, you can take it back or Eric, but um, I really say, appreciate it. I, yeah. I just want to point out that there are people who say, we have all the solutions we need. We just have to deploy them. What I love about Gina is she says, we have to ferociously deploy everything we got today. And we got to ferociously innovate for new things and that those are not in conflict. Gina no. spent so much of her time managing to get this deployment happening. I mean, we all know charging stations, you just gotta have them because you can't unlock a market. And maybe it's not the cutting edge of new technology, but it's essential. What I love is you see the whole spectrum and you have charged PCAS. And uh, one thing I'm gonna just let PCAS know is when Gina says that, like, I need you to do this, it's impossible to say no to Gina. So I think we actually have to take this as like a, a bit of a mission. We were talking about it. And so, so Gina, I think you got folks um, interested and bought into to this. We were having an exploratory discussion here, but you may have, may have us hooked now. Look, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's really an exciting opportunity. Uh, you know, I can't say that I know the path forward. You know, I just, I just don't. And re remember, the, the framing that the president is using has to get us from here all the way to net zero. 
It can't be that we've hit a wall, we've done everything we can cost effectively. Now let's sit down and contemplate our navel for what comes next. We have to be contemplating our navel now, pick a few winners and, and try to run with them. Um, because if we don't, we'll be surpassed by other countries who think more quickly on their feet and are willing to invest. And, and so we have a great cabinet. That's the one thing I, I, I really enjoy. It's, it's not just Eric's partnership, but you know, Secretary Granholm is all in on these issues. Secretary Buttigieg is in. We've got Secretary Vilsack running like crazy on smart egg issues. I mean, you go on and on and on, and we just have people who want to partner. But we, we also know that it's going to take the breadth of your experience and what you bring to the table to help us decipher what are the biggest three things maybe that we really want to drive and, and to use that to really make leaps forward. Thank you, Gina. Go do good things. I know you have a hard stop, but thank you for coming. Uh, it was great to thank see you all. Much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Appreciate it. So, before the interruption, to hear from uh, those inspiring words, I promised the floor to Andrew. And I hope, oh, good. I hope that, uh, oh, yes, Jigar Shah is still on with us. Great. I, I'm I'm here and and uh, you know those inspiring words I think are right you know when she said set targets well fusion's ready we are ready for ambitious targets um, you know ambitious targets that that probably uh, go faster than a lot of people think that that we can do but we we are ready give us a target um, and if you you want to talk about jobs or manufacturing. Just imagine what it's going to look like when we're building thousands of power plants, fusion power plants in, in factories in the United States, because that's what the scale up here is going to look like. It is rapid scale up, but it's factories and it's manufacturing. This is a job space for the 21st century. And if, if it's not here, it's going to be somewhere else. So, so let's make the investments now to do it. Now, uh, Director Lander had, had talked about the COTS program and LPA, Loan Program Office. What I'd say is FIA members are not looking at the loan program office as the next step, the place where we're going to right now. Um, we think you know something like the clean, clean Energy Demonstrations Office just stood up in the Department of Energy might be the right place for some sort of COTS program like this, some sort of outside office, or even within the existing Fusion Energy Sciences program. They just, they, they did a report on this a couple of years ago on what it would look like. We think that, that we can go much faster than this. And we, we think it would need to be, you know, kind of set up with some, you know, go fast uh, people uh, from outside uh, to, to really accelerate it and move it. But a milestone program, yes, let's do it. Let's, let's get it stood up. Honestly, we don't care where you put it, but, but we don't anticipate that it'll be in the loan program office, which is really for the building of power plants. We are building um, the proof of concept plants and then pilot plants and then power plants. So we can do those three steps in a decade, but we've got to move fast to do that. And so we're, we're ready and, and that it just kind of different boxes on the government. Or, or, well, well said, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. And I, let me just say my interest is where the whole Department of Energy can use milestones, whether it's in Jigger's office or elsewhere. I think I think the real question is just, you know, PCAST was, was talking uh, a, a little while ago about all the levers we've got, the different ways to advance things and when you should use one or the other. And that's where my question comes from. I'd love to continue with the DOE. The, the range of financial levers that there are and where they should sit and which technologies are ready for what. So let's take that off as a, as a further conversation because I am enthusiastic that the DOE is lose, leaning forward on being able to really accelerate industries by figuring out what are the steps need, that they need to go forward. So thank you both. And I'm gonna hand it back to Francis. Thank you. Andrea. Great. I had a, a question for Katie. Um, I love the idea of having these, you called it tough tech accelerators. I call it hard tech accelerators, something I'm trying to build out of Princeton. 
Um, I think that has some interesting lessons for our nanotechnologies working group, for our exploratory group looking at building regional innovation tech hubs. But I, I think it's also very hard and, and you need the right people that are deciding, you know, what, what should we be investing in? You need the right time frame. I mean, you talked about four valleys of death. That could be for a software company in, you know, six months. And for a tough tech company, it could be over span of a decade, which is a VC fund uh, duration. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on some of the challenges that you've encountered trying to do this and what lessons we can take for PCAST and thinking about how do we build these regional tech accelerators? How do we, you know, uh, give advice to Biden about what to invest in and how to invest and how basic research can see these things? A lot of questions for you, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk about them uh, because I think you're right. The, this What we're doing is not easy. It definitely takes long-term perspective and commitment. So for instance, in our partnership with MIT, that's not a short-term commitment um, to the ecosystem and to building these types of entrepreneurial ventures, right? So really when I started and I said it jokingly, like luckily both my grandmothers lived to a hundred, <laughs> but I meant that pretty seriously that if you're gonna do these kind of very ambitious projects that could become the industries of the future, you can't take a five-year perspective. You have to take a 20 or a 30-year perspective and build that way. And what and I'm gonna say a couple of things about entrepreneurs, but we very specifically decided to bet on the scientists and engineers that wanted to start these companies because we know that these very deep or hard or tough, whatever you want to call it, companies uh, require true breakthrough technology. And therefore, betting on the scientists and entrepreneurs and, and engineers to become the CEOs and entrepreneurs that will bring these companies uh, forward is really important. And a lot of people don't believe that. But I think we stood really strong with that. And that means you have to surround them by business people, but you are betting on people. And that means that the government, I think, has to put more money into these fellowship programs during PhD programs where you're really teaching entrepreneurship. And I can give you every, almost every example of an entrepreneur that we have backed has been backed by a program like that, often philanthropically funded. But if you want equity in this country and you want all of our great scientists and engineers to have that aspirational value to create these companies, that kind, those kind of dollars have to be spread everywhere, not just in our elite and very wealthy institutions. So that's one problem. The second problem is the investors that do this kind of investing. Like I could invest in anything. I could invest in software and make money a lot faster. So you have to find and train people that care about the outcomes we're shooting for. And that isn't hard, but it has to be done with intention. And, and, you know, I think especially this generation coming up cares a lot about impact, justice, and equality. And so when we set up these things around universities, you can't, you can't let go of the values that we hold dear when you're setting these things up. And then third, you've got to put the muscle of, of the ecosystems behind this. So, you know, Princeton has plenty of spaces that could be unleashed to create entrepreneurial hubs in deeper, tough tech. And many other, like look at Houston, so much of the oil industry is converting over to clean tech. Like think about what that ecosystem could do if it, if it, put its mind to it. And the government could support that with matching dollars, grants, tax incentives, et cetera, um, if, if there isn't enough private capital to do it. Thank so, you, Kate. That's Thank what's you. Happening. We've yeah. got uh, one and a half minutes left in this public session, Maria. Okay, well, I'll try, try to be quick here. So, um, so if we 
for any of these technologies, a bunch of fantastic talks here. Um, if, if we wanted to put pedal to the metal and accelerate these as fast as we could, we, we talked about funding mechanisms and valleys of death. Do we have the talent? If we had the funding, do we have adequate talent to do the acceleration? Are we talent limited or are we funding limited? And uh, anybody could comment on that. Properly deployed, we have the, the amount of talent in the national labs to get going on fusion. Uh, properly deployed, we, we're, we're ready. Uh, I so, would just say national, no, national labs not. are all working on ITER though, right? Properly deployed. The, okay. We have uh, enough uh, support to, uh, to, to get going on this. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Zuber, on the, on the uh, carbon capture and super hot rock geothermal end, there's a lot of skill transfer from the oil and gas industry uh, potentially over to those areas. So there's a, I think there's a reservoir of soon to be available talent, let's put it that way. I, I would just in, add- In the I, area of uh, disruptive solar, the perovskites that I mentioned, uh, the US has the leading talent and we could easily own the next uh, solar manufacturing industry. Awesome. Katie. And I would just say, um, I think in all of infusion, for instance, if we're really gonna develop that, there will be thousands of incredible jobs made and we're gonna have to train that talent. I mean, Maria, we have talked about this. You're gonna have to train talent in every one of these new industries, which means very good jobs. And that Thank should you. be music to everyone's ears. Thank you. Phil, can you give us your point in 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah just it's a very, very quick question for Harry. In your presentation, you, you made a point about resilience. I just question, is that resilience of the components, resilience of the entire environment? I didn't quite understand what that, what that was referring to. Yeah, it, it refers to both, uh, both some of the things that Steve Pakala and Armin were talking about in terms of building out resilient infrastructure for power transmission and, uh, you know, uh, uh, demand sensitive, but at the component level, that's what I was uh, stressing, uh, that we can increase the energy yield of renewable energy systems like solar and wind by simply making them last longer and be uh, uh, less degradation. And that's an area that is not uh, uh, um, as uh, stimulating scientifically as pushing performance, but in terms of impact, it's uh, equally important. That's a great point. And, and Harry, you've got to open and close this public session. I want to thank all the speakers, the audience and all the members of PCAST for participating in this session. As usual, we fill, beyond filled it. Uh, again, I would like to uh, inform the audience that we'll have a PCAST meeting in March. Um, I'm now uh, going to uh, pass it on to Eric, who will uh, invite Stephen Krivet in public comments. Great. Thank you so much, Francis. So uh, PCAST meetings include a public comment section for any member of the public who wants to make a two-minute comment. Um, and we have one individual who signed up in advance. I want to confirm that Stephen Krivet is online and I'm able to speak, is that right? Hello, oh, Eric, just... yes, I'm here. You are here, excellent, very good, I didn't see you there, thank you so much. So we invite you, Stephen Privet from New Energy Times to speak. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, distinguished council members. When you hear people talk about nuclear fusion, it's important to understand that the required fuel sources for commercial nuclear fusion do not exist. Only deuterium is available abundantly and in nearly unlimited quantities. Tritium is a different story. It does not exist in nature as a natural resource with the exception of tritium produced by and for military agencies. The only tritium available for scientific or industrial use is produced from a small, specialized fleet of aging heavy water nuclear fission reactors. By 2060, all of these reactors are scheduled to be decommissioned. As an alternative, fusion scientists have hoped that enriched lithium-6 could be used to breed tritium inside fusion reactors. It's certainly possible for this physics reaction to occur, but there's two problems. First, fusion reactors will need 
tons of lithium-6. And aside from the military production of lithium-6 for nuclear weapons, there is no source for commercial lithium-6 at the level of tons. The second problem, as identified in a 2020 paper published in the leading peer-reviewed fusion journal, is that there's no known method to breed tritium faster than it will be consumed and lost in fusion reactors. I'll be sending a scientific citations to you via the PCAS organizers. I thank you for your attention and your service to President Biden. Thank I want to you, thank you for that extremely information rich comment and for sending us readings and materials. It's exactly the function of the public comment session is to allow knowledgeable people to contribute to the PCAST meeting and you have done so. So thank you very much. All right. I think we now turn to closing remarks uh, because we've just had, I gotta say two days of pretty amazing meetings. And so I will turn back to maybe let's, let's give Maria a chance and then Francis, and then I'll just take us out there. All right, well, I, I wanna thank the speakers for uh, all their contributions. The, the comments were really thought provoking and informative and, um, and it, it gives us a lot of things to think about for where PCAS could make recommendations to uh, move to net zero as quickly as possible. So Francis, turn it over to you. Thank you, Maria. I want to thank everybody. It, it's another rip-roaring PCAST meeting uh, with plenty of discussion and many ideas, many more than we can possibly <laughs> handle at this point, but I'm very glad we have a, a highly capable group. And I look forward very much to seeing you in person in March. Indeed, indeed. Let me, let me just pile on the rip-roaring comment the talks were just plain very good. I mean, you you know, we've all been through lots of talks, but to have a session where every single talk is not just you know rich and good information, but so clearly and and, and thoughtfully presented. Um, wow, wow! I don't get the pleasure of sitting through a session with with such you know just total consistency of of excellent talks, everybody, you know, pushed us in all sorts of ways. And um, I'm going to guarantee you that you will have generated many fold more hours of discussion at PCAST that from the, the time we spent today. And that's an amazing service. And I think uh, Administrator McCarthy's visit to PCAST um, really reflects her growing commitment to the innovation. I mean, she's so totally uh, committed to deployment, but I think over the, the past months, as she's been able to, you know, lift her head up around some of the other things that are going on, and she's, she's accomplished so much, I think she has a tremendous appetite for innovation. And I do think we as PCAS should talk about how we can serve uh, the nation's needs and, and her desires to to make sure that we're, we're thinking broadly about all the ways to drive these technologies, because we're all committed to getting to net zero fast, and that will require everything we have today and a whole lot of things we don't have today. So what a great session, what a great discussion. Thank you, everybody. For PCAS members, we'll be reaching out in preparation for the next meeting and for the working groups that are underway. For the speakers, just again, a huge thank you. For everybody watching today, thank you. And everybody who will be watching in the future, including me, who's going to watch it at least the second time, maybe a third. Anyway, goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. See you soon.